Good evening, everyone. Uh, on behalf of SOIL, I welcome all the attendees to the second session in this webinar series. I would also like to welcome our eminent speaker, Mr. TV Narendran, CEO and MD of Tata Steel, and uh, Mr. Muthu Raman. And of course, our host for the evening, uh, SOIL founder and chairman, Mr. Anil Sajdev. Over to you, Anil, sir. Uh, what a pleasure, uh, Narendran, to have you on this uh, particular digital channel of SOIL. And it is just that uh, the universe has conspired to have Mr. Muthuraman in the same space as an observer, as an enabler, as somebody who is here to encourage us to have this conversation with you. And what a delightful surprise to have him uh, listen to the dialogue uh, while I ask you these wonderful questions. So, so thank you once again. And you know what, something I remember a lot about you, Narendra, and my very first meeting with you many years back, what struck me was the ease with which you had this understanding of the entire global business environment and how you could comprehend the complexity and use very simple language to describe that complexity. The other thing I noticed about you is the very wonderful colleagueship you had. I mean, as a part of our getting to know you and your team, all the feedback that your colleagues gave about you was not only that you were highly respected as a colleague for what you stood for, but they genuinely liked you. And this is a very rare combination, people who respect you and also like you because many leaders are respected but not liked. Many people are liked but not respected. Mm -hmm. So I just want to say this is, uh, these are my opening comments about uh, what we discovered many years You're back about. Kind. You're very kind. Maybe you should sign off when the going is good. Yeah. <laughs> you have a very, many, many more years before you can even think like that. Okay, now let me ask you my favorite question in this uh, particular context. Out of all the things you have done, Narendran, over the years, what are the moments in time you remember when you were at your happiest best, where the best work came from you, but also you were extremely happy doing that work? Well, are you talking of the workplace? I mean, uh, more focused on the work yeah. life? Uh, work and life itself. You can choose both if you wish. <laughs> yes. So I think if I look at life in general, my happiest times are the times I spend with my family. You know, and I think uh, all through. Uh, so uh, maybe because I get very little time with my family, I value it even more as uh, the days go by. But that to me is obviously uh, uh, the time when I'm the most relaxed and, uh, you know, uh, happiest in that sense of the term, right? So if I leave that aside in the workplace, I think I've always enjoyed my work. And I think I, my advice to anyone is uh, pick up a job or a company that you would enjoy working for, because uh, if you have to succeed, you have to work very hard. And if you have to succeed, you have to do a good job. And you can't work very hard and do a good job if you don't enjoy uh, what you're doing. So, I mean, I think I've had enormous... Uh, joy in, uh, you know, whatever I did, whether it was out there selling steel and uh, dealing with difficult customers and severing the success of doing a deal or, you know, uh, you know, just working in uh, a different environment. Uh, soon after I used to work with Mr. Mutraman, he sent me to Singapore, working with a very different set of people, building equity with them till then. I'd always worked with people who'd seen me, known me, but suddenly, you, you know, uh, rather late in your professional life, you're trying to rebuild equity with people who'd never known you. So I think, again, uh, all that gives you, I think all that gives you a lot of uh, satisfaction if it turns out well. I think I love the challenge. I love the space that is given when you go into these roles. Uh, I love the uh, uh, joy that you get if things work out well. And... Uh, the learnings that you get from this whole journey. So to me, a job which uh, uh, keeps helping me develop professionally, uh, you know, keeps teaching me things as much as I can keep contributing to the job, gives me a lot of joy. And I think when I work for Tara Steel or Tara Group, you feel that there's a larger purpose as well. So you don't mind all the hard work because, uh, you know, there is a larger purpose, uh, you know, which uh, motivates you. 
and makes you feel that that hard work is worth it. That's absolutely wonderful. What you're really telling is that if you really want to have joyful life and work, you should choose the organization and the people and choose that. And once you are choosing a company that has a strong sense of purpose and values and where the people also share that, then all the effort that you put and hard work that you put, you know, is really worth it. And that's what you're really saying. You should look forward to going to work on Monday morning. And if you do, you're working for the right company. Oh, wonderful. Out of all these uh, decades you have spent in Tata Steel, if there is one thing you are asked to pick up where you and your team did something that brings smiles to your face even now, what would that be? I think uh, I, I go back. There are multiple things which... Uh, uh, have happened, uh, you know, more recently. And even as we live it, I think there's a crisis we are living through. Uh, we lived with a crisis uh, in 2014, soon after I'd taken over, when our minds were closed for the first time in 100 years. Uh, I think the way the team rallied around at that time, the way the team is rallying around now, uh, shows the strength of the institution, the strength of the leadership team, the passion and commitment of the employees. Uh, you know, it then tells us why this company has been around for 110 years. I, I was just telling somebody the other day, we must be one of the few companies in the world who've seen two pandemics, right? And I was looking at our archives to see how did we deal with the pandemic in 1919. And there are instructions there on how to deal with workers, uh, you know, and make sure that when they come back to work, they are uh, safe, you know? So things like that. So one is there is a lot of joy from uh, uh, dealing with a crisis. You don't want a crisis, but when it comes the way you come together to deal with it. But... Uh, if I go back even further, I think, uh, uh, you know, it was in early days uh, of branding and distribution for Tata Steel. I think uh, I was a chief of marketing and sales when we launched Tata Triscorn as a brand. The B2C business was just getting started. Uh, we had a lot of people who didn't believe in it. I must, I'm not saying it because Mr. Mutraman is online. He was one of the guys who believed in it. Uh, but, uh, you know, the joy of uh, the challenge of creating something which uh, went against the grain of normal thinking in the steel industry at that time, uh, working with the distributors, convincing them, and finally seeing that I, I mean, after two years, I moved out of the business. But today to see where it is, I think gives you a lot of joy. So I think there are multiple experiences that we've had in Tata Steel, which uh, give me a lot of joy, the challenges that we faced, the uh, New, new things that we did, and we are never short of that. So in both these occasions, when you did that very innovative concept, which I, which was completely unheard of, branding steel in the way that you did, and creating a whole customer experience around that, that means for the first time, a commodity like steel, there was a personal touch, there was something at the emotional level that the customer began to experience of trying to relate to the Tata brand and Tata Steel brand. And then once again, when the minds were closed because of an extraordinary crisis that came to India, what you talk about is that how everybody came together and worked with single-minded focus to take that challenge head on. So can you describe a little bit about what kind of things you all did in both the occasions? What's, so, what's unique about the Tata Steel culture that manifested during these two important stories that you talk about? So I'll talk, uh, uh, I'll talk about what happened in 2014 when the mines were closed, you know. Uh, so we, I think the good thing about uh, the institution is, uh, you know, how multiple people with multiple capabilities who are in the leadership team come together and work together, keep aside professional egos and differences they may have with each other because everyone feel so passionately about the company and feel so emotionally connected with the company saying that, hey, this is the time when we put the larger purpose in front of us and not worry about who we like and who we don't like. Uh, so the first step is even when the mines were closed, I think we anticipated that things were going to go wrong. Okay, We knew that the new law was coming and we knew that uh, there would be some, in, in, in fact, this was before the new law. We knew that there was a judgment going to come and the judgment could go either way and the consequence would, uh, would be immense. And two, three months before the mines closed, we decided to import iron ore, you know, which was unheard of in Tata Steel. We've never had to import iron ore. So it was a big expenditure, but we could take that call. We said, let's do it and test 
stress test the system. Can we import iron ore and bring it in? And a lot of small, small things came up. Railways didn't have a freight rate to move iron ore from the ports to the Jamshed port because there was never a need for a freight rate for iron ore to be imported into India. Right? So those things took time. The handling equipment in the ports were not suited for importing iron ore. It was suited for exporting iron ore. So there were a large number of small things which came up. And because all that happened, when the mines actually closed two, three months later, we were much better prepared uh, to do a lot of things, right? So again, the team came together. Uh, when you come together, when you work together, and we are doing today what we did then, we used to have daily calls. And then that's when everyone, somebody, the guy who's handling the supply chain would say, this is a problem. The guy who's importing it or the purchase guy would say, that's a problem. And you, within an hour, you kind of address these problems, go out there and do it. We're doing it today. Every morning, 9.30 to 11, the entire leadership team is together on a Microsoft Teams call. And uh, we discuss micro issues, which vendor is close where and what is that impact to other people. So it's a great time to bond together, great time to work together seamlessly. And uh, the passion that the employees and the leadership team has for the company, the confidence that there is that we can address the problems if we work together, the self-belief, the faith that uh, we can come out on tops, I think these are hugely energizing. So, and the other thing which happens in Tata Steel, which happened then, which is happening now, we also look at what is it that we can only do during a crisis? Okay, what are the experiments that you can do today which you couldn't have done when you were running full out? We did that in 2014. We experimented with the, uh, what's called the coke rates and the blast furnaces, and we improved the coke rates by about 100 kilos, which means 1,000 crores a year. So that was the benefit we got out of that crisis. Today, we are looking at what are the different blends of coal that we can use. Now, these are experiments you can't do in a plant which is running at 100% and you wouldn't want to tinker around and mess with a, uh, you know, something flowing smoothly. But if you're operating at 50% capacity, you have all the time and the capacity available to do experiments which you couldn't have done before. So we ask ourselves, what is it that we can do today which we couldn't have done? And let's not waste this crisis. Let's leverage the crisis as much as we fight with it, deal with it and uh, sort things out. So I think this is the spirit which uh, is special. Maybe other, I'm not saying no other company has it, but Tata Steel has tons of it. And uh, that helps. And I think that's the reason why we've lived through so many uh, crises in the past and always come out on top. You know, something that intrigued me very much, the very first time we did some extended piece of work with you when I was heading Aisha Consultancy in 1999, Something that struck me, on one hand, uh, there was another global consulting com company working with you. And my very first experience of Tata Steel was the authenticity and the willingness to engage with some very difficult subjects, including the fact that there was a need for reorganizing, restructuring the organization. But you did something which even today, when I talk to uh, companies around it, they, they, they say it's almost unbelievable when some people had to leave the organization for as a part of the reorganization. Not only were you very transparent, there was a method, there was a process. And then you did something unthinkable. You said to the people who were going that for the rest of their life, they would continue to earn the same compensation that they were earning at that moment. And they could even pick up a job with someone else. When I share this in a global forum, people say, this is unbelievable. They've never heard any organization do something like that. Where does this spirit come from? This large heartedness, this generosity that even when there is a painful process, you find it absolutely the right thing to do with your people. Where does that come from? So I think there's a sense of fairness, which is there in the ecosystem. Uh, which uh, pervades a lot of this thinking. I will not say, I will not claim Tata Steel is perfect. I think uh, I will not claim that because there are many who are also unhappy with Tata Steel. So it's not uh, fair to pretend that we are perfect. Right? But having said that, I think we try to be as fair as possible. Fair to the individual and fair to the company. It's also not about being so fair to the individual that you're unfair to the company. Right? I always tell some of my colleagues that the company also had a voice and could speak up. Maybe the company would also have a lot of complaints against us, just like all of us have complaints against the company. So one should look at the balance of fairness. But I think we do stuff which, uh, you know, because there's a soul. The company has a soul, right? You talked about employees and what you just described is 
is something which started uh, 20 years back and still continues, right? But uh, more recently, maybe about eight, nine years back, even before uh, I became the MD, one of the things which was initiated by the board of Tata Steel and Mr. Muthraman was the vice chairman at the time, so you'll remember this. We used to have, we still have fatalities, unfortunately. We've done a lot of work on safety, we've improved things tremendously, but we still have fatalities occasionally. And oftentimes these fatalities are contract workers, not that we treat them any differently from employees. And uh, the board of Tata Steel said that, hey, but you know, employees, if something happens, we have well uh, established processes to take care of them. You know, uh, uh, you know, we take care of the family, we offer a job, we give them the last one salary, so on and so forth. But for the contractor who loses a life, we, you know, leave it to the contractor to do whatever is required. So after a number of discussions, I used to be the vice president of safety and flat products, so I was involved in those discussions. After a number of iterations and discussions, the Tata Steel board decided that any contract worker who loses his life in Tata Steel, his last drawn salary, factored for inflation, plus an allowance if he has kids for education, plus an allowance for medical, will be gone, will be given to his, uh, you know, uh, whoever is his nominee, his spouse, or whoever. And this is done by Tata Steel. So it's not just employees, it's even for contractors. Okay. And that and is for life. life. That is for, for that life. For life. Till their, till their um, uh, notional age of retirement. So wow. the whole thing, the whole thing is that you cannot uh, substitute. You can't replace that person. You can't substitute for that loss of a person. But the family should not feel the economic loss of that person, right? And so that's the thing. And that uh, started, I think, in 2012 or something, and uh, still continues. So we have. It's called the Suraksha scheme. I, I doubt, I don't know of too many companies who have something like this. It's called the Suraksha scheme. Any contract worker in any Tata Steel site, uh, you know, has an accident, a fatal accident. I mean, obviously, we don't want that to happen. But if that happens, that family is taken care of. That's you remarkable. Know, so I think that's, that's, that's a different, so, uh, that's uh, you know, uh, that's where the soul of the company comes through. And this was... Yeah. Obviously discussed at the board and the board mandated, uh, in fact, the board kept pushing back the management to say, you guys come back with a better plan. Along with this very strong people orientation and a company with a soul, you also had the, the power of your vision to say that you want to be amongst the best, if not the very best. I remember again in my very first experience, you chose to make a statement that you will become the lowest cost steel producer in the world. And then over the years, you added other benchmarks, not just the lowest cost. We want the best in customer experience. We want to go and uh, challenge the Deming prize and the Deming journey. We want to be in terms of excellence in whatever we do. We want to be amongst the best, if not the best. So where does this aspect also come from? That it is not just on the intangibles of the softer dimension, and the ethical dimensions that Tata's are known for, but also the strategic dimensions of being the best in the industry and amongst the leaders in the world. Where did that come from? I think that uh, probably came in the early 90s. Uh, till the early 90s, the steel industry in India was protected. We didn't have the freedom, neither did we have the kind of competition that uh, we've uh, learned to uh, deal with subsequently. So the 90s were a crucial period for this journey. I think uh, that was a period when Tata Steel realized that if it didn't change, it can't survive, right? And, uh, and Tata Steel is a company which has been written off by critics many times in its history, right? Right from the very beginning. So even in the 90s, when uh, it opened up, everyone said Tata Steel will die because they, all these new guys were coming up all over the place and they will be far more efficient and Tata Steel doesn't have the product mix, doesn't have the efficiency, so on and so forth. That's when this aspiration to be the lowest cost producer was uh, kind of uh, articulated and we chased that and we became the lowest cost producer. Even today, I think uh, bar the Russians who share some of the advantages that Tata Steel has of having raw materials and also has a ruble which has become very weak over the last few years. On a dollar basis, some of the Russian producers are cheaper than us, but uh, we have pretty much been in the top five ever since. Right? But this pursuit of excellence I think companies which have been around for a long time sometimes have a tinge of arrogance, you know, and there is a feeling that, hey, you know, we've been there, we've done that, we know it all, right? 
And Tata Steel is unique uh, now as a group. We have three sites which are over 100 years old. The one in Port Talbot in Wales, the one in Imodin, and the one in Jamshipur. And all sites which are, you know, typically been there for a long time and been successful most of the time, have this feeling that, hey, I'm pretty much out there and the best. So how do you translate that arrogance into confidence and self-belief, not make it arrogance? And how do you bring in that humility that is required to keep accepting that what got us so far is not what is going to keep us ahead? So I think that is coming. That is certainly coming and that's very much there. So irrespective of all the accolades we've got, whether it was the JRD QB Award, which is the Apex Award in the Tata Group or the Deming Prize, Deming Grand Prize. But uh, nobody says that, hey, there's no room for me to improve, you know. So we keep pushing ourselves and we keep saying that, you know, how do we redefine ourselves? And oftentimes we benchmark with people outside of the industry. If you're the best in the industry, you can't sit and say that you're the best. Then you can say, hey, why can't I benchmark safety with, uh, uh, you know, DuPont or with uh, some oil company? Or why can't I benchmark something else with uh, some other company? We benchmarked at that time in the late 90s, our customer complaint handling processes with Modi Xerox. At that time, they had a very good complaint handling process. You know, we benchmarked our credit management process with Citibank at that time. So we've always looked beyond the industry as well to benchmark. A lot of our B2C business is benchmarked with consumer marketing companies, right? So I think if you think, uh, uh, you know, you're amongst the best in your industry, you have to go beyond your industry. Always look for somebody who's better than you and learn. And I think I have, as long as you're a student all your life, I think you'll keep doing well. That's a, what a nice thing to say. I think that spirit of inquiry and of learning and continuously improving, which really brings me to the point. I remember many years back when we were also assisting you and serving you in this whole area of succession planning. I remember Mr. Muthuraman and Mr. Ratan Tata making a very important statement. They said, you know, steel industry is ready for significant innovation because no major innovation has occurred in this industry for a long time. And so they were saying that I think in the future, some significant innovation may occur and the Tata Steel leaders may have to lead that thinking. So what is your sense about that? How are you and your team creating your own future and looking at innovation and the innovation agenda? Sure. No, it's interesting you brought it up and I think Mr. Muthraman will remember this uh, uh, from the time when he was a CEO. I, I remember once Mr. Tata asked him, you guys have been around for 100 years, what is your contribution to the industry? Right? And I think that's a very powerful question. You know, it was about saying, what has Tata Steel contributed to the steel industry? And you know, the uh, honest answer even today is, you know, if I were to be brutally honest, not much. We've been a benchmark in operational efficiency, people practices, many things. We are very proud of many things that we've done. But is there any new technology that we brought in, uh, you know, for a company who's been around for 100 years? I mean, there are some areas. I think cold-based DRI is an area where we've done some work. Stamp charging is an area where we've done some work. But uh, if I look at some of our peers uh, who are seen as technology leaders, I think uh, we have some ground to cover, right? We always sought help on technology. So this is the question we have posed ourselves and we've set a goal to say that, how can we be one of the top five in the world in technology in the next five, 10 years? You know, we said that a few years back. And, uh, but, you know, for that, you need to be more innovative. We need more breakthrough thinking. We have been very strong on continuous improvement. Okay, that's our DNA every year you come in and say, how can I get better than last year? But breakthrough and thinking, breakthrough innovation and uh, thinking needs a little bit better. It's not necessarily the whole organization uh, needs to do that. So you need to find the parts of the organization which needs to be innovative. And you need to leave parts of the organization which needs to do their day job consistently day in and day out. You don't want everyone everywhere innovating, right? So finding that balance. So we picked some areas where we said we need to do that one. And over the last few years, I think uh, we've made some progress. So there are, for instance, there are five areas. They said, if he said, what are, what are the areas where we need to be a technology leader, for instance? We picked four or five areas, okay, including how can you make use of poor quality raw material uh, in the steel making process? And there is a lot of very good work going on on how to use non-coking coal to make, uh, to use in the steel plant, right? Now, 
So we, we are doing a lot of work on proteins. We are now doing a lot of work on new materials, on graphene, on fiber reinforced polymers. Uh, and on the marketing and sales side, where I think there's been a little bit more innovation over the years, uh, as you probably know, we've gone into this new segment of services and solutions. We have this fantastic product, which is a steel door, which looks like a wooden door. And uh, Pravesh is, uh, we are selling about 10, 15 doors a month now. We want to sell 100,000 doors a month. So there's a huge amount of work going on. So there are pockets of Tata Steel where I'm starting to see a lot of innovation. Uh, we, some time back, we engaged uh, Professor Vijay Govindrajan, uh, 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 you know, to, uh, uh, to work with us on this. He has his own three box uh, concept. Uh, and there's something he has said, which I think is very, very uh, relevant for Tata Steel. He also, uh, you know, said a company which only talks of its past has no future. Okay. And I think that's a very powerful statement. We should be very proud of our past. We should celebrate our past. But, uh, you know, if our predecessors only talk of the past, we wouldn't be where we are today. Right. Uh, so to me, we should, as leaders, we should look at the future. The past was uh, delivered by our predecessors. What is the future that we are going to deliver so that our successors have also a past to celebrate about? So I think, th so that's why we even tag the line we also make tomorrow. Because it connects with, we also make steel, which everyone remembers. But we said that, hey, so the tagline was important, but how do I pivot around that and focus on tomorrow? You know, and uh, that was the whole thing. And so, so there's this whole thing. So the whole organization keeps talking about tomorrow in different ways so that we constantly remind ourselves that we have a responsibility as leaders to create tomorrow, which is exciting for all the youngsters who just joined us. Now, Narendran, this brings me to a very critical question before we throw it open for a Q and A. A lot of people are already asking questions. You know, you are very conscious of something that you do exceptionally well. And of course, I can talk on your behalf to say, what are your unique strengths? But you are aware of your own strength. You're also aware of the collective strengths of this organization and the group that you are a part of. And now this biggest crisis that uh, mankind is facing, which I think it's a complete understatement to say it's the biggest challenge. I mean, it's just turned the world completely. People are still in a state of shock. They don't know how to deal with this, right? How do you think you will leverage your own strengths and the strengths of the collective team and the group that you are part of to take on this crisis? And what are your thoughts about leveraging the best in you? to provide the kind of leadership that this organization and in fact the country needs and the world needs. So what are your thoughts on that? So there is uh, a startup group. There's always a lot of expectation, right? I mean, I think people look to us uh, to step up and in some sense be the role model corporate, right? That is the expectation. And as you know, the group has uh, uh, already stepped up quite a bit whether it's the Tata Trust, Tata Sons, and obviously the group companies along with Tata Sons, right? So hence, right up front, the group announced uh, a corpus of something like 1,500 crores, which was much more than anybody else uh, was, uh, had uh, talked about. But it's not so much a number. It's not about writing a check for 1,500 crores. There's a huge amount of work going on in multiple group companies. Okay? It's whether the Taj uh, providing food to the doctors, providing the hospitals for the doctors to stay, whether it is Tata Chemicals making sanitizers, uh, whether it is uh, Tata Motors trying to make ventilators, um, you know, and of course Tata Steel is, uh, you know, already created 1,200 uh, isolation uh, beds in uh, Odisha and Jharkhand. Tata Steel is feeding about 60,000 people every day in multiple sites. Uh, you know, we are very much part of the effort in Odisha and Jharkhand. On behalf of the group, we are pretty much taking care of things. And the group is already operating in, uh, in fact, the last number I saw from the group yesterday or day before was we already fed 2 million people uh, since the crisis started across multiple uh, sites. And we are already active in 24 states. We have already uh, imported and bought uh, hundreds of thousands of uh, PPEs. And we already placed orders for so many tens of thousands of ventilators. We are airlifting stuff from wherever we can. Uh, so I think uh, 
uh, you know, in multiple ways, uh, in many small ways. In Jamshedpur, we have got uh, women or families whose spouses are stuck, uh, you know, uh, across the country somewhere and not able to come back. We are giving them livelihood. We are getting them to start kitchen gardens. We've tied up with Zomato to deliver the vegetables to the citizens of Jamshedpur. We are getting women to make masks, which we are selling to people and giving them the money. You know, so uh, even our employees who have some time, who are sitting at home, they are volunteering. We have something called a Masti Ki Patshala for kids who, you know, basically abandoned kids who we take care of, educate them. So our employees who have the time are talking to them, telling them stories online, you know, engaging with them, engaging with the elderly in the, you know, uh, and many other things. We as a company told our sales guys who are all stuck and not able to go and meet customers, please reach out to the retired uh, people of Tata Steel in the multiple cities, see if they need help, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, offer whatever support we can. So I think uh, everyone wants to do things. Obviously, one thing which we always do is immediately when there's a crisis like this, uh, one day salary and the matching contribution from the company goes, uh, you know, the unions are telling us, you tell us what more we can do. So I think this is where, again, uh, people uh, are happy to work for the group and for the company because they see what the company is doing. They want to do more because they say, hey, the company is doing so much. So I think, uh, you know, these uh, are the uh, occasions when, uh, like I said, if you're working for a company with a soul or a group with a soul, you feel proud about that. Uh, again, uh, as I say, I'm not again pretending that we are perfect or we are the best or nothing like that. All I'm saying is we try to do things uh, uh, to the best of our abilities. And, uh, you know, I think that's what keeps us all together. And the way the world will come out in the future and the way it is going to be, the world will be shaped. And uh, are there some things which are, which are, which you are sourcing from the inside to say, what is going to be the future state of the world? What is the vision that you are getting at this moment? So many things will change, right? I think, uh, uh, you know, uh, one is all of us need to reflect on how can I make more productive use of people, space and time. Okay. Uh, because we've all kind of realized how technology can take our productivity to a very, very different level. Right? And, uh, you know, in a place like Bombay, where people would sometimes be traveling two hours one way and four hours every day to come and do things which they could do from their home. The question is, do you really want them to spend four hours coming to the office to do something they could have done from their house? Right. So these are questions. The question is, do you need all these conference rooms that we have in offices because we can do meetings like this? Uh, so one needs to redefine the paradigm of the workplace. One needs to even think about organizations if they exist as they exist. Uh, you know, the nature of organizations uh, may change. Uh, at a more business level, I think uh, over the last couple of years with the actions or the problems between China and the US on trade had already led to a localization of supply chains or a de-risking from China kind of strategy. Uh, this pandemic is going to drive more localization of supply chains. Uh, because people are not going to want to take the risk of having supply chain spread all over the world. Uh, the middle class anyway feels that globalization is not working for them. Uh, so again, you know, countries will start looking a bit more inward. Uh, if I look at the eastern region uh, and northern and the poorest states in the country, where which were the source of a lot of migrant workers, I doubt very much if migrant workers will want to travel long distances uh, for work because you really hear some of the stories, you know, people say, okay, I didn't have much money. I used to earn 500 rupees a day, but I never had to stand in queue for food, right? I mean, that's a matter of dignity. You know, nobody likes to stand in queue for food and people are standing three, four hours for food, right? So I, so I think it's going to a lot of, and these people say that, hey, I'd rather be in my village because at least I don't, I may not have money, but I won't have to stand in a line for food, right? So I think a lot of people are going to go back, want to get back home. Even what we saw in Bombay when there was a rumor that the train services started. It's not about migrant workers trying to rush back to work. It's about migrant workers wanting to go home. Right? So to me, I think we'll have to rethink a lot of things. Uh, it's also been reflection time for people on what really are their priorities. Uh, you know, 
So I think there's going to be a lot of changes and organizations have to be, you know, think very, very differently about how we want to uh, look at the workplace, how we want to look at the organization, how do we want to look at people. It also throws up a lot of opportunities. People will be able to monetize their value much more than they did in the past. Education is going to get disrupted. So I think it's, uh, it's uh, like with any big event, there will be a lot of uh, disruption and organizations have to anticipate it and uh, reflect on it. And we are also doing our own share of reflection. Thank you. One of the students who has uh, just joined Soil, in fact, the day before yesterday, the new cohort of um, about 100 students began their uh, one-year program online. And of course, in the near future, they will come to campus. This person is asking, Himank Kapoor, he's saying, what are your high and low points in your life while working during, in your tenure in Tata Steel? And then he's asking, what did you learn of the, out of these high and low points? And how is that now showing up in the kind of leadership that you demonstrate? I think, uh, obviously, there are many high points and that's why. <laughs> I'm where I'm, I am where I am, right? So I'll leave that aside. I think, uh, I mean, one is, I always tell myself, don't get overexcited when things go well and don't get too uh, pessimistic when things go bad. And we are in a cyclical industry, so we live through highs and lows all the time, right? Uh, to me, the biggest low point for me professionally has been uh, safety. And I go back to that subject because uh, I was personally responsible for it till I became the CEO. Even as a CEO, I committed to make Tata Steel a zero fatality place. It's still not there. Not for want of effort. I mean, huge amount of work is going on. But it's just that, uh, you know, uh, there is a tendency that we think accidents will happen to other people. We don't take the precaution that we need. We take risks because we do it multiple times and nothing happens to us. And so we kind of assume it will, nothing will happen to us. So there is a lot of this mindset change which needs to change. As, and as one of our consultants from DuPont told me at that time, don't manage safety as a metric, manage it like a value. You know? so, so there is this journey we are going through. We, are, we keep getting awards in the World Steel Association because we are one of the best in the world. But that's not good enough uh, till you have zero fatality. So if I were to, that is my biggest professional disappointment of something I've won so hard to achieve, but we've not achieved. A whole bunch of other stuff and to me uh, business performance goes up and down and we have to live with that and keep moving on. I think what uh, uh, you know what uh, it teaches you is firstly you should never give up. You should persevere. Like somebody once said in a boxing match it's not over when you fall it's over when you don't get up. So it's right. every time you get knocked off uh, get up and get on with it. So I think uh, and people uh, uh, you know, I think success comes if you, uh, it's not because you had a nice rosy path uh, to wherever you are, but it's because you picked yourself up multiple times. And I think all of us should learn to do that. And there will always be disappointments, uh, you know, but we should not give up if we have faith in ourselves. So obviously, Himank has done a lot of research on you and your various uh, media interventions, because he says once you gave an interview in which you said, Tata Steel is a battleship. You cannot drive it like a power boat. <laughs> so what, what could you elaborate what you meant by that? Yeah. You know, this is also something uh, that we are trying to do. So, you know, one is uh, there are a number of things we are doing, which is about making Tata Steel structurally stronger. You know, our growth, uh, growing the India business, uh, taking some portfolio calls on the overseas businesses, makes Tata Steel structurally stronger. And there are a whole bunch of stuff we do. Uh, services and solutions so on. But what we are working on now is how do you make Tata Steel culturally future ready? You know, structurally you're making yourself future ready. Culturally, how can you make yourself future ready? So innovation is one of the things that we're working on, as I said earlier. The other thing is agility. Okay. So uh, Tata Steel, if there's a criticism of Tata Steel, it is that it is slow, it is big. You know, it moves very slow. So agility is important. But at the same time, you cannot have an expectation. This is, that's what I meant. This is like a battleship. You cannot keep overreacting to every trigger or every provocation and keep moving in one direction or the other because there's a lot of inertia. You point in one direction, it moves there. 
you know so you better think about which direction you want it to be pointed rather than every morning you get up and say let's run in some other direction right so you need to think through you need to because it's a large organization a complex organization and you can't uh, have it chasing the flavor of the day right so that's what i meant by saying you have to drive it like a battleship and not drive it like a power boat but having said that the question is how do you bring agility with stability okay uh, it's not about creating a culture of a startup because a startup is a startup this is a 100 year old organization it's a manufacturing organization and again the same thing as i said about innovation it's not that the whole organization needs to be agile there are parts of it which are automatically agile the customer facing parts if you're not agile you won't survive but the parts which you need to make more agile are the internal facing parts the internal uh, functions which provide services to many parts of that industry and we are working a lot on that so i think we are driving this whole agility thing now we are in the middle of this journey uh, you'll probably uh, see some impact in a year or two ankita das podarsh a young woman here asked a question that given the current covid situation what are the specific difficulties you are expecting in the coming days are there some you already talked about some but are there certain things you are anticipating and therefore preparing for so one thing is this virus is not going to go away in a hurry right so the world will be totally safe only when there's a vaccine and that vaccine is available to a lot of people right and all reports say that this vaccine is at least one year away even if it comes in a year obviously whichever country gets it first will first take care of its citizens before offering it to the rest of the world and even within its citizens uh, it would offer it first to the health workers for instance you know they need it more than anybody else they are getting exposed every day so the prediction is that it's going to take at least 2 to 3 years before you know this vaccine is available at the scale that is required for people to feel that they are not at risk and to go about leading life like they did a uh, few months back right so till such time i think we should be ready for a very volatile environment even in india lockdown may open on the 3rd of may a uh, few few weeks later you may see a recurrence or a spread uh, uh, at a faster rate which may trigger some more lockdowns may not be a nationwide lockdown but it could be parts of it companies like ours which depend on supply chains with vendors and customers all over the place can get impacted if some uh, cluster of industrial activity gets shut down and uh, i was reading somewhere that most of 70 80% of india's gdp comes from very few districts right so if any of those districts gets impacted it impacts us so i think what we are uh, getting ready for is a world which is going to be uh, fairly volatile in terms of uh, business and uh, so a lot of the agility we wanted to build in maybe uh, we will need to build it in much faster and uh, this crisis is a great opportunity for us to stress test us on uh, agility so i see a fairly volatile environment from a business point of view and we should be ready for that ashok ramchandran the president of aditya birla group uh, a dear friend is uh, is very uh, sort of inspired by what you are sharing and he is asking a question that how do you cascade the creation of a culture consistently across a large and spread out workforce and what are the two or three three things that you have which set you and starter steel apart in building this shared and co created kind of culture you know that he wants to know as to some of the base that you deploy to make that happen yeah so it's like uh, any change management program right so there has to be a top down kind of uh, work but eventually the uh, it has to grow bottom up right if it is top down it will only last as long as the pressure is put from the top if uh, that effort uh, translates into seeds being grown and uh, roots being grown at the bottom then the culture change happens so anything that we pick so how how does it happen firstly the leader has to believe in it has to want it very very uh, badly and push for it and stand by it even if things are not happening right so i think that is step one right second is communicate it explain it why is it important is not just because i read a book and i say okay let's do it it has to be relevant people have to believe in it they have to explain to it how does it matter to them how will it change their life what it could be anything it could uh, be safety it could be a culture of continuous improvement it could be a digital transformation journey whatever you do then you need to create 
you need to have a set of people who are believers like you. And they don't necessarily need to be your direct reports. It could be people down the organization. And you need to create a cohort of them and they become your uh, evangelists in some things. You need to then start the bottom of stuff. You need to start celebrating good work being done uh, locally or whatever you want to do. You know, you need to have ways of recognizing them, rewarding them, talking about it, so on and so forth. And slowly the momentum starts uh, picking up. I'm explaining at a very broad level, but you know, any anything that you pick, Tata Steel, I think has gone through these uh, multiple steps. Uh, sometimes it requires people, uh, you know, when we started the digital transformation journey about three, four years back, uh, you know, we sent our leadership team in batches to uh, California, to uh, San Francisco and uh, see the companies there and what's happening there. Uh, we created a set of reverse mentors. We had a bunch of people who are below 30, who are good at this, uh, good at this, and they became mentors for all of us, including me. So all so two things happen. One is the employee engagement with the younger demographic, which uh, you know had typically had the lowest engagement score, started improving because they were getting quality time with the leadership team, and leadership team was able to ask questions they were embarrassed to ask in public and engage with them and uh, get a lot of learning, and uh, all this helped in uh, creating this culture. And today, I think in the digital transformation journey at least in the manufacturing space, we are one of the companies who are ahead of uh, most. So I think uh, there are large number of small things that need to be done. And eventually, if it is important, then you need to weave it into your performance management systems or you promote people, so on and so forth, so that it matters. It's not something that you do as a hobby, but uh, very important to uh, your uh, growth and development uh, in the organization. And hopefully, sooner than later, and I would say in two to three years or four years, it becomes a way you work and you don't have to do any more specific reviews on that subject. And it's integrated into the way you run the company and where you work, then you know that it's embedded in the company. And then you pick up something else. The other thing is, don't try to do too many things, uh, you know, at the same time, or, you know, it's not that every three months you think of something new. I think if you start something, stay with it, take it to completion. And normally I find that it's a three to five year journey. And then it's kind of picked up its own uh, inertia. There is a very interesting question from Narendra, who is um, a significant community leader of an organization called Chinmaya Organization of Rural Development. Okay. They are doing some amazing work on for the poorest of the poor in many districts, including in Odisha and in Tamil Nadu, in Andhra and in Himachal. So Narendra says that what what is your message for young leaders to teach them the habit of giving more than taking? Yeah. I think uh, even this crisis has told us how lucky we are in many ways. Every one of us is lucky in some sense. You, know, you may always say, I don't have this and I don't have that. But you will always find uh, people who are far less than you. Right? So I think uh, just being thankful for what we have, I think is a good starting point. Uh, the next is, if we all say that, hey, how can I make a positive difference to people around me, uh, either professionally or personally or uh, through the community, I think that's also a good way to uh, reflect on it. And uh, it's also not just about writing a check. And I think uh, we've been, Tata Steel has done a huge amount of CSR and contributed a lot. But one area where we feel we don't do enough is employee volunteering. You know, we're doing far more than we used to do earlier, but still nowhere near where we should be. So we're also encouraging employees to say that, hey, uh, it's not just about me feeling good about what the company is doing. What is it that you're doing in terms of not just writing a check, but what is the time you can come in? And I think for many people, it's not that they don't want to do it, but till they experience the challenges in the community. And uh, we did that, for instance, uh, you know, uh, when you're we doing this Kalinganagar project, we realized that, uh, you know, a lot of us assume that the community will be happy to have us because the community is happy to have us in Jamshedpur. But when you go to a new place, it's not necessary that they are happy to have you and you need to build that trust before you build the walls. So, but then for that, the leadership team and the whole entire management team there needs to also appreciate what the community is going through. So we started doing this community. In, uh, so what happens in a Tata Steel context is you have a very strong CSR team. 
So the line managers think it's a CSR team's job. You know, okay, they will deal with the community. I'll go and produce TV. You know? So we started taking all these guys and saying that, please go and spend two weeks in a village or go and live there. You know, and we started doing these immersion programs. And once we started doing them, they had a far greater appreciation of the challenges that the community was facing. And not just saying that, okay, the CSR guy's job is to go and deal with that and my job is to go and produce tea. So there was far more empathy and uh, far more reasonableness into the way you look at the situation that the community is going through. So, so the conversation is, uh, I would say, a much better and a richer conversation than if you don't understand where the other side is coming from. So I think uh, some of these uh, experiences uh, are what I think can really make a difference, can be impactful. So if you can create these experiences for the youngsters, I think uh, not everyone will convert, but many of them will convert and have a more giving nature. One of your former colleagues, uh, Subodh Majumdar, he says he had the privilege of working with Tata Steel in the automation division in late 90s. Okay. And he said, we worked on some of the latest technologies there at that time, like machine learning, which were quite ahead of time. And do you have any specific plans to leverage automation division to spearhead the innovation journey for Tata Steel? Yeah, they're very much a part of uh, our whole transformation journey. I, I think uh, Mr. Majumdar will, uh, you know, understand it better. You know, we used to have automation as separate. Now, what we've done is in the last few years, uh, we've got everyone together, the automation team, the IT team, the digital transformation team, all of them work together. We have a CIO uh, who's, uh, who understands the industry, but who's not from the industry, who's come from TCS. Um, and Jayanto has done a great job of bringing everyone together. And there are multiple projects that are going on just now. So in terms of, uh, you know, whether it's the plant automation, whether it is uh, the kind of... Uh, analytics that you're building in to the systems, uh, you know, artificial intelligence that is coming in, the multiple projects which are going on. I think there's a huge amount of work going on. Uh, the Tata Steel Kalinganagar plant uh, has been, uh, uh, what do you call it, recognized as what is called a lighthouse in the World Economic Forum. Basically, the World Economic Forum picks manufacturing sites which uh, are advanced in the use of analytics and automation and uh, uh, you know, so the first uh, steel plant in this list was our plant in Imobil. And the second steel plant in this list is the one in Kalinganagar. It's the only manufacturing site in India, which is called the Lighthouse. And uh, so there's a lot of this work going on. And uh, our colleagues there are doing a great job. You know, Thomas, uh, who is the head of uh, SEDAP, which you are associated with, Tata Steel is a founding member of yeah. the Executive Education School in the INSEAD campus in Fontainebleau. So Thomas is asking an unusual question. He says some of the employees might have a concern that Tata or Tata Steel as we know it right now may not even exist after the crisis. I mean, there are some people who are talking about some huge changes in the way industry will be for the future. And if employees have some concerns on the very survival of an organization, how would you answer the concerned employees or stakeholders of this possible fear? And what can you tell them to assuage their concerns or, you know, make their fears reduced? Yeah, I think obviously everyone's entitled to their fears, right? And I think the first invitation I would say is, let's have a chat. Let me understand that fear and let me understand where it's coming from. You know, I think uh, the comfort and confidence we should have is, we have had many crises in the past and uh, I think we've always come out stronger, you know. Uh, so that faith and belief that uh, we are an organization who survived many crises, not to have the, not to try, not, not for it to be, um, not for it to manifest itself uh, in complacency, but, uh, you know, more in terms of the confidence and the belief and the faith that you should have. Like I said, you get knocked out, you pick yourself up. So you pick yourself up and move on. So that is one. Secondly, uh, you know, uh, to me, if I, what is Tata Steel's uh, security or what is Tata Steel's uh, uh, passport for survival? One is you should be the last man standing in your industry. Okay. If you're the last man standing in your industry, everybody else has to die before you die. Okay. I think we are pretty much in that position. Okay, at least the India business, 
one of the lowest cost producers of steel in the world steel prices keep crashing all the others or most of the others have to die before that industry dies the larger question is will steel as a material become irrelevant 40 times more steel is used than any other material okay the next commonly used material is aluminum and i think uh, steel will continue to be used how many materials are available at 40 rupees a kilo right i i was telling people a couple of years back that the price of onions right 40 rupees a kilo now i think onions is 10 rupees a kilo so it used to be 100 rupees a kilo or something right and yeah this is an industry which spends billions of dollars mining making steel selling it at 40 rupees a kilo and making tata steel makes 25 30 percent debit a margin on that price you know despite investing billions of dollars so so i think it's very very difficult to kill an industry which is quite competitive so versatile and so embedded in anything that you do even today why is steel an essential service because it's required we are selling steel for making hospital beds we are selling steel for making hospitals we are selling steel for making ambulances even today right so uh, so the industry or the metal will survive if the metal and the industry survive strata steel will survive narendra one last question yeah uh, the whole world is watching india not this huge experiment of what we are doing in this country to take on our challenges with 1.3 billion people but they are also looking to india for some sanity for some guidance which is the inner journey of leaders because this country is seen as a source of a spiritual wisdom authentic leadership inspired leadership is there something you are moved to say as to what is india's unique position in the world both in the way we handle our problems and what do we have to offer based on our own wisdom tradition that you might want to share with the rest of the world yeah. you know like somebody once said everything you say about india is true and the opposite is also true right so to me uh, uh, i think what as a country we've demonstrated is the kind of discipline which i don't think anyone thought india could demonstrate india was seen for many things you know seen for all that you said the uh, philosophical bent the spiritual bent the uh, you know uh, a kind of uh, very in, uh, welcoming kind of culture and many things diversity so on and so forth but there is one thing that we all of us used to say we are not disciplined right and we used to admire other nations who we felt were more disciplined but i think i would have never imagined that something like this uh, lockdown i know there are many challenges with the lockdown many issues but you know people have largely been disciplined you know there are many exceptions and i think so we demonstrated that as a country if we set our mind to it we can really do things which doesn't come naturally to us in some sense of the term so that gives me even more hope right secondly uh, this is a country which uh, has enormous potential as a market because of the talent because of the entrepreneurial spirit because of its adaptability and many other things uh, i think this uh, crisis has also been a wake up call and the question which is being asked is why are we dependent on so many other countries for so many things we can so easily make them the most classic example is the pp kits being made in tirupur and everywhere as is the 2 billion dollar market which we were never active in right Uh, so so to me i think it throws up enormous opportunities for india so if the world is looking at localizing supply chains they will look at markets uh, countries which are potentially a large market and i think india is one of those countries uh, there is a lot of talent in india which will now prefer to work in india because uh, again for various reasons just like the migrant worker doesn't want to go far away from uh, uh, their uh, places to other parts of the country i think there'll be a lot of talent in india who after this experience will want to be close to home so i think i look at the positive side of it there are huge opportunities for india uh, in many ways if india and china grow uh, you know i think uh, it can pull the world out of uh, the problems that they are in economically and uh, i think the also the talent in india can help develop the vaccines that are required and find the solutions that they need to so i see it as uh, a lot of opportunity for india 
as a country to demonstrate the global leadership it always has the potential to demonstrate but has uh, probably not demonstrated in our public in the past and narendran what a pleasure to host you this uh, this evening and here are five things that i learned from you today and this is not what you said but about you as a leader one you were completely candid there was candor in your conversation which i think the authenticity you don't have to remember what you speak the last time because you can be very when you are having that candor and that authenticity you don't have an even to attempt to remember what you said somewhere else one the two i really learned from you this what there are some tough questions out there and you don't want to put anything you know like you want to put some wool over people's eyes you are willing to face the difficult things and you're willing to talk about the difficult things the third thing i learned from you today is that you are continuously stressing that we may have done great things but we as tata steel also need to do many things differently and you continuously stress that which is that thing which is really that humility to say a humility is not about talking about not talking about your achievements but your humility is to say there is a new future to be created the fourth i learned from you that you have great pride in belonging to tata steel and the soul of tata steel and the tata group and what a joy that is to me having started my own career with tata that one time and worked with another great company called aisha where we had the same degree of love for our company and the last thing that i want to say is that uh, you are very happy to learn at the same time you you show the growth and learning mindset and you are willing to say i don't know something and let's go ahead and do that so what a what a what a wonderful uh, you know experience for me personally to have this conversation with you narendran thank you very much for uh, coming on this uh, conversation and i'm sure a lot of people watching this on social media and others would be very grateful for the time you spent with us thank you thank you very much privilege to be here thank you for inviting me and a privilege to talk to you